This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life, 6th London Edition, by Charles Darwin, Chapter No. 2, Variation Under Nature. Contents of this chapter include Variability, Individual Differences, doubtful species, wide-ranging, much diffused and common species very most, species of the larger genera in each country vary more frequently than the species of the smaller genera. Many of the species of the larger genera resemble varieties in being very closely but unequally related to each other, and in having restricted ranges. Before applying the principles arrived at in the last chapter to organic beings in a state of nature, we must briefly discuss whether these latter are subject to any variation. To treat this subject properly, a long catalogue of dry facts ought to be given, but these I shall reserve for a future work. Nor shall I here discuss the various definitions which have been given of the term species. No one definition has satisfied all naturalists, yet every naturalist knows vaguely what he means when he speaks of a species. Generally the term includes the unknown element of a distinct act of creation. The term variety is almost equally difficult to define, but here community of descent is almost universally implied, though it can rarely be proved. We have also what are called monstrosities, but they graduate into varieties. By a monstrosity I presume is meant some considerable deviation of structure, generally injurious, or not useful to the species. Some authors use the term variation in a technical sense, as implying a modification directly due to the physical conditions of life and variations in this sense are supposed not to be inherited, but who can say that the dwarfed condition of shells in the brackish waters of the Baltic, or dwarfed plants on alpine summits, or the thicker fur of an animal from far northwards, would not in some cases be inherited for at least a few generations. And in this case I presume that the form would be called a variety. It may be doubted whether sudden and considerable deviations of structure, such as we occasionally see in our domestic productions, more especially with plants, are ever permanently propagated in a state of nature. Almost every part of every organic being is so beautifully related to its complex conditions of life, that it seems as improbable that any part should have been suddenly produced perfect as that a complex machine should have been invented by man in a perfect state. Under domestication, monstrosities sometimes occur which resemble normal structures in widely different animals. Thus pigs have occasionally been born with a sort of proboscis, and if any wild species of the same genus had naturally possessed a proboscis, it might have been argued that this had appeared as a monstrosity, but I have as yet failed to find, after diligent search, cases of monstrosities resembling normal structures in nearly allied forms, and these alone bear on the question. If monstrous forms of this kind ever do appear in a state of nature, and are capable of reproduction, which is not always the case, as they occur rarely and singly, their preservation would depend on unusually favourable circumstances. They would, also, during the first and succeeding generations, cross with the ordinary form, and thus their abnormal character would almost inevitably be lost. 
but I shall have to return in a future chapter to the preservation and perpetuation of single or occasional variations. INDIVIDUAL DIFFERENCES The many slight differences which appear in the offspring from the same parents, or which it may be presumed have thus arisen from being observed in the individuals of the same species inhabiting the same confined locality, may be called individual differences. No one supposes that all the individuals of the same species are cast in the same actual mould. These individual differences are of the highest importance for us, for they are often inherited, as must be familiar to every one, and they thus afford materials for natural selection to act on and accumulate, in the same manner as man accumulates in any given direction individual differences in his domesticated productions. These individual differences generally affect what naturalists consider unimportant parts, but I could show, by a long catalogue of facts, that parts which must be called important, whether viewed under a physiological or classificatory point of view, sometimes vary in the individuals of the same species. I am convinced that the most experienced naturalist would be surprised at the number of the cases of variability, even in important parts of structure, which he could collect on good authority, as I have collected, during a course of years. It should be remembered that systematists are far from being pleased at finding variability in important characters and that there are not many men who will laboriously examine internal and important organs, and compare them in many specimens of the same species. It would never have been expected that the branching of the main nerves close to the great central ganglion of an insect would have been variable in the same species. It might have been thought that changes of this nature could have been effected only by slow degrees, yet Sir J. Lubbock has shown a degree of variability in these main nerves in caucus, which may almost be compared to the irregular branching of the stem of a tree. This philosophical naturalist, I may add, has also shown that the muscles in the larvae of certain insects are far from uniform. Authors sometimes argue in a circle when they state that important organs never vary, for these same authors practically rank those parts as important, as some few naturalists have honestly confessed, which do not vary, and under this point of view no instance will ever be found of an important part varying, but under any other point of view many instances assuredly can be given. There is one point connected with individual differences which is extremely perplexing. I refer to those genera which have been called protean, or polymorphic, in which species present an inordinate amount of variation. With respect to many of these forms, hardly two naturalists agree whether to rank them as species or as varieties. We may instance rubus, rosa, and hieracium among plants, several genera of insects, and of brachiopod shells. In most polymorphic genera some of the species have fixed and definite characters. Genera which are polymorphic in one country seem to be, with a few exceptions, polymorphic in other countries, and likewise judging from brachiopod shells, at former periods of time. These facts are very perplexing, for they seem to show that this kind of variability is independent of the conditions of life. I am inclined to suspect that we see, at least in some of these polymorphic genera, variations which are of no service or disservice to the species, and which consequently have not been seized on and rendered definite by natural selection, as hereafter to be explained. Individuals of the same species often present, as is known to every one, great differences of structure, 
independently of variation, as in the two sexes of various animals, in the two or three castes of sterile females or workers among insects, and in the immature and larval states of many of the lower animals. There are, also, cases of dimorphism and trimorphism, both with animals and plants. Thus Mr. Wallace, who has lately called attention to the subject, has shown that the females of certain species of butterflies, in the Malayan archipelago, regularly appear under two or even three conspicuously distinct forms, not connected by intermediate varieties. Fritz Muller has described analogous, but more extraordinary cases, with the males of certain Brazilian crustaceans. Thus the male of a Tanais regularly occurs under two distinct forms. One of these has strong and differently shaped pincers, and the other has antennae much more abundantly furnished with smelling hairs. Although in most of these cases the two or three forms, both with animals and plants, are not now connected by intermediate gradations, it is possible that they were once thus connected. Mr. Wallace, for instance, describes a certain butterfly, which presents in the same island a great range of varieties, connected by intermediate links, and the extreme links of the chain closely resemble the two forms of an allied dimorphic species inhabiting another part of the Malay archipelago. Thus also with ants, the several worker castes are generally quite distinct, but in some cases, as we shall hereafter see, the castes are connected together by finely graduated varieties. So it is, as I have myself observed, with some dimorphic plants. It certainly at first appears a highly remarkable fact that the same female butterfly should have the power of producing at the same time three distinct female forms and a male, and that an hermaphrodite plant should produce from the same seed capsule three distinct hermaphrodite forms, bearing three different kinds of females, and three, or even six, different kinds of males. Nevertheless, these cases are only exaggerations of the common fact that the female produces offspring of two sexes, which sometimes differ from each other in a wonderful manner. Doubtful Species the forms which possess in some considerable degree the character of species, but which are so closely similar to other forms, or are so closely linked to them by intermediate gradations, that naturalists do not like to rank them as distinct species, are in several respects the most important for us. We have every reason to believe that many of these doubtful and closely allied forms have permanently retained their characters for a long time. For as long, as far as we know, as have good and true species. Practically, when a naturalist can unite by means of intermediate links any two forms, he treats the one as a variety of the other, ranking the most common but sometimes the one first described as the species, and the other as the variety. But cases of great difficulty, which I will not here enumerate, can sometimes arise in deciding whether or not to rank one form as a variety of another, even when they are closely connected by intermediate links. Nor will the commonly assumed hybrid nature of the intermediate forms always remove the difficulty. In very many cases, however, one form is ranked as a variety of another, not because the intermediate links have actually been found, but because analogy leads the observer to suppose either that they do now somewhere exist, or may formerly have existed, and here a wide door for the entry of doubt and conjecture, is opened. Hence, in determining whether a form should be ranked as a species or a variety, 
the opinion of naturalists having sound judgment and wide experience seems the only guide to follow. We must, however, in many cases, decide by a majority of naturalists, for few well-marked and well-known varieties can be named which have not been ranked as species by at least some competent judges. That varieties of this doubtful nature are far from uncommon cannot be disputed. Compare the several floras of Great Britain, of France, or of the United States, drawn up by different botanists, and see what a surprising number of forms have been ranked by one botanist as good species, and by another as mere varieties. Mr. H. C. Watson, to whom I lie under deep obligation for assistance of all kinds, has marked for me one hundred eighty-two British plants, which are generally considered as varieties, but which have all been ranked by botanists as species, and in making this list he has omitted many trifling varieties, but which nevertheless have been ranked by some botanists as species, and he has entirely omitted several highly polymorphic genera. Under genera, including the most polymorphic forms, Mr. Babington gives 251 species, whereas Mr. Bentham gives only 112, a difference of 139 doubtful forms. Among animals which unite for each birth, and which are highly locomotive, doubtful forms, ranked by one zoologist as a species, and by another as a variety, can rarely be found within the same country, but are common in separated areas. How many of the birds and insects in North America and Europe, which differ very slightly from each other, have been ranked by one eminent naturalist as undoubted species, and by another as varieties, or, as they are often called, geographical races? Mr. Wallace, in several valuable papers on the various animals, especially on the Lepidoptera, inhabiting the islands of the great Malayan archipelago, shows that they may be classed under four heads, namely, as variable forms, as local forms, as geographical races or subspecies, and as true representative species. The first or variable forms vary much within the limits of the same island. The local forms are moderately constant, and distinct in each separate island. But when all from the several islands are compared together, the differences are seen to be so slight and graduated, that it is impossible to define or describe them, though at the same time the extreme forms are sufficiently distinct. The geographical races or subspecies are local forms completely fixed and isolated, but as they do not differ from each other by strongly marked and important characters, there is no possible test but individual opinion to determine which of them shall be considered as species and which as varieties. Lastly, Representative species fill the same place in the natural economy of each island, as do the local forms and subspecies, but, as they are distinguished from each other by a greater amount of difference than that between the local forms and subspecies, they are almost universally ranked by naturalists as true species. Nevertheless, no certain criterion can possibly be given by which variable forms local forms, subspecies, and representative species can be recognized. Many years ago, when comparing and seeing others compare the birds from the closely neighboring islands of the Galapagos archipelago, one with another, and with those from the American mainland, I was much struck how entirely vague and arbitrary is the distinction between species and varieties. On the islets of the little Madeira group there are many insects which are characterized as varieties, in Mr. Wollaston's admirable work, but which would certainly be ranked as distinct species by many entomologists. 
Even Ireland has a few animals, now generally regarded as varieties, but which have been ranked as species by some zoologists. Several experienced ornithologists consider our British red grouse as only a strongly marked race of a Norwegian species, whereas the greater number rank it as an undoubted species peculiar to Great Britain. A wide distance between the homes of two doubtful forms leads many naturalists to rank them as distinct species. But what distance, it has been well asked, will suffice? If that between America and Europe is ample, will that between Europe and the Azores, or Madeira, or the Canaries, or between the several islets of these small archipelagos, be sufficient? Mr. B. D. Walsh, a distinguished entomologist of the United States, has described what he calls phytophagic varieties and phytophagic species. Most vegetable-feeding insects live on one kind of plant, or on one group of plants. Some feed indiscriminately on many kinds, but do not in consequence vary. In several cases, however, insects found living on different plants have been observed by Mr. Walsh to present in their larval or mature state, or in both states, slight though constant differences in colour, size, or in the nature of their secretions. In some instances the males alone, in other instances both males and females, have been observed thus to differ in a slight degree. When the differences are rather more strongly marked, and when both sexes and all ages are affected, the forms are ranked by all entomologists as good species. But no observer can determine for another, even if he can do so for himself, which of these phytophagic forms ought to be called species, and which varieties. Mr. Walsh ranks the forms which it may be supposed would freely intercross as varieties, and those which appear to have lost this power as species. As the differences depend on the insects having long fed on distinct plants, it cannot be expected that intermediate links connecting the several forms should now be found. The naturalist thus loses his best guide in determining whether to rank doubtful forms as varieties or species. This likewise necessarily occurs with closely allied organisms which inhabit distinct continents or islands. When, on the other hand, an animal or plant ranges over the same continent, or inhabits many islands in the same archipelago, and presents different forms in the different areas, there is always a good chance that intermediate forms will be discovered which will link together the extreme states, and these are then degraded to the rank of varieties. Some few naturalists maintain that animals never present varieties, but then these same naturalists rank the slightest difference as of specific value, and when the same identical form is met with in two distant countries, or in two geological formations, they believe that two distinct species are hidden under the same dress. The term species thus comes to be a mere useless abstraction, implying and assuming a separate act of creation. It is certain that many forms, considered by highly competent judges to be varieties, resemble species so completely in character that they have been thus ranked by other highly competent judges. But to discuss whether they ought to be called species or varieties, before any definition of these terms has been generally accepted, is vainly to beat the air. Many of the cases of strongly marked varieties or doubtful species well deserve consideration, for several interesting lines of argument, from geographical distribution, analogical variation, hybridism, etc., have been brought to bear in the attempt to determine their rank, 
but space does not here permit me to discuss them. Close investigation, in many cases, will no doubt bring naturalists to agree how to rank doubtful forms. Yet it must be confessed that it is in the best known countries that we find the greatest number of them. I have been struck with the fact that if any animal or plant in a state of nature be highly useful to man, or from any cause closely attracts his attention, varieties of it will almost universally be found recorded. These varieties, moreover, will often be ranked by some authors as species. Look at the common oak, how closely it has been studied, yet a German author makes more than a dozen species out of forms which are almost universally considered by other botanists to be varieties. And in this country the highest botanical authorities and practical men can be quoted to show that the sessile and pedunculated oaks are either good and distinct species, or mere varieties. I may here allude to a remarkable memoir lately published by A. de Candolle on the oaks of the whole world. No one ever had more ample materials for the discrimination of the species, or could have worked on them with more zeal and sagacity. He first gives in detail all the many points of structure which vary in the several species, and estimates numerically the relative frequency of the variations. He specifies above a dozen characters which may be found varying even on the same branch, sometimes according to age or development, sometimes without any assignable reason. Such characters are not of course of specific value, but they are, as Asa Gray has remarked in commenting on this memoir, such as generally enter into specific definitions. De Candolle then goes on to say that he gives the rank of species to the forms that differ by characters never varying on the same tree, and never found connected by intermediate states. After this discussion, the result of so much labor, he emphatically remarks, They are mistaken, who repeat that the greater part of our species are clearly limited, and that the doubtful species are in a feeble minority. This seemed to be true, so long as a genus was imperfectly known, and its species were founded upon a few specimens, that is to say, were provisional. Just as we come to know them better, intermediate forms flow in, and doubts as to specific limits augment. He also adds that it is the best known species which present the greatest number of spontaneous varieties and sub-varieties. Thus, Quercus rober has twenty-eight varieties, all of which, excepting six, are clustered round three subspecies, namely Q. pedunculata, sessiliflora, and pubescens. The forms which connect these three subspecies are comparatively rare, and, as Asa Gray again remarks, if these connecting forms which are now rare were to become totally extinct, the three subspecies would hold exactly the same relation to each other as do the four or five provisionally admitted species which closely surround the typical Quercus rober. Finally, de Candolle admits that, out of the three hundred species, which will be enumerated in his Prodromus as belonging to the oak family, at least two-thirds are provisional species, that is, are not known strictly to fulfill the definition above given of a true species. It should be added that de Candolle no longer believes that species are immutable creations, but concludes that the derivative theory is the most natural one, and the most accordant with the known facts in paleontology, geographical botany, and zoology, of anatomical structure and classification. 
When a young naturalist commences the study of a group of organisms quite unknown to him, he is at first much perplexed in determining what differences to consider as specific, and what as varietal, for he knows nothing of the amount and kind of variation to which the group is subject, and this shows, at least, how very generally there is some variation. But if he confines his attention to one class within one country, he will soon make up his mind how to rank most of the doubtful forms. His general tendency will be to make many species, for he will become impressed, just like the pigeon or poultry fancier before alluded to, with the amount of difference in the forms which he is continually studying, and he has little general knowledge of analogical variation in other groups, and in other countries, by which to correct his first impressions. As he extends the range of his observations he will meet with more cases of difficulty, for he will encounter a greater number of closely allied forms. But if his observations be widely extended, he will in the end generally be able to make up his own mind, but he will succeed in this at the expense of admitting much variation, and the truth of this admission will often be disputed by other naturalists. When he comes to study allied forms brought from countries not now continuous, in which case he cannot hope to find intermediate links, he will be compelled to trust almost entirely to analogy, and his difficulties will rise to a climax. Certainly no clear line of demarcation has as yet been drawn between species and subspecies, that is, the forms which in the opinion of some naturalists come very near to, but do not quite arrive at, the rank of species, or, again, between subspecies and well-marked varieties, or between lesser varieties and individual differences. These differences blend into each other by an insensible series, and a series impresses the mind with the idea of an actual passage. Hence I look at individual differences, though of small interest to the systematist, as of the highest importance for us, as being the first step towards such slight varieties as are barely thought worth recording in works on natural history. And I look at varieties which are in any degree more distinct and permanent, as steps toward more strongly marked and permanent varieties, and, at the latter, as leading to subspecies, and then to species. The passage from one stage of difference to another may, in many cases, be the simple result of the nature of the organism and of the different physical conditions to which it has long been exposed. But with respect to the more important and adaptive characters, the passage from one stage of difference to another may be safely attributed to the cumulative action of natural selection, hereafter to be explained, and to the effects of the increased use or disuse of parts. A well-marked variety may therefore be called an incipient species, but whether this belief is justifiable must be judged by the weight of the various facts and considerations to be given throughout this work. It need not be supposed that all varieties or incipient species attain the rank of species. They may become extinct, or they may endure as varieties for very long periods, as has been shown to be the case by Mr. Wollaston with the varieties of certain fossil land shells in Madeira, and with plants by Gaston de Saporta. If a variety were to flourish so as to exceed in numbers the parent species, it would then rank as the species, and the species as the variety, or it might come to supplant and exterminate the parent species, or both might coexist and both rank as independent species. But we shall hereafter return to this subject. 
From these remarks it will be seen that I look at the term species, as one arbitrarily given, for the sake of convenience, to a set of individuals closely resembling each other, and that it does not essentially differ from the term variety, which is given to less distinct and more fluctuating forms. The term variety, again, in comparison with mere individual differences, is also applied arbitrarily, for convenience sake. Wide-ranging, much diffused, and common species vary most. Guided by theoretical considerations, I thought that some interesting results might be obtained in regard to the nature and relations of the species which vary most, by tabulating all the varieties in several well-worked floras. At first this seemed a simple task, but Mr. H. C. Watson, to whom I am much indebted for valuable advice and assistance on this subject, soon convinced me that there were many difficulties, as did subsequently Dr. Hooker, even in stronger terms. I shall reserve for a future work the discussion of these difficulties, and the tables of the proportional numbers of the varying species. Dr. Hooker permits me to add that, after having carefully read my manuscript, and examined the tables, he thinks that the following statements are fairly well established. The whole subject, however, treated as it necessarily here is with much brevity, is rather perplexing, and allusions cannot be avoided to the struggle for existence, divergence of character, and other questions, hereafter to be discussed. Alphonse de Candolle and others have shown that plants which have very wide ranges generally present varieties, and this might have been expected, as they are exposed to diverse physical conditions, and as they come into competition, which, as we shall hereafter see, is a far more important circumstance, with different sets of organic beings but my tables further show that, in any limited country, the species which are the most common, that is, abound most in individuals, and the species which are most widely diffused within their own country, and this is a different consideration from wide range, and to a certain extent from commonness, oftenest give rise to varieties sufficiently well marked to have been recorded in botanical works. Hence it is the most flourishing, or, as they may be called, the dominant species. Those which range widely are the most diffused in their own country, and are the most numerous in individuals, which oftenest produce well-marked varieties, or, as I consider them, incipient species. And this, perhaps, might have been anticipated, for, as varieties, in order to become in any degree permanent, necessarily have to struggle with the other inhabitants of the country, the species which are already dominant will be the most likely to yield offspring, which, though in some slight degree modified, still inherit those advantages that enabled their parents to become dominant over their compatriots. In these remarks on predominance, it should be understood that reference is made only to the forms which come into competition with each other, and more especially to the members of the same genus or class having nearly similar habits of life. With respect to the number of individuals, or commonness of species, the comparison of course relates only to the members of the same group. One of the higher plants may be said to be dominant, if it be more numerous in individuals, and more widely diffused, than the other plants of the same country, which live under nearly the same conditions. A plant of this kind is not the less dominant because some conferva inhabiting the water, or some parasitic fungus is infinitely more numerous in individuals, and more widely diffused. But if the conferva, or parasitic fungus, exceeds its allies in the above respects, it will then be dominant within its own class. Species of the larger genera in each country, 
vary more frequently than the species of the smaller genera. If the plants inhabiting a country, as described in any flora, be divided into two equal masses, all those in the larger genera, i.e., those including many species, being placed on one side, and all those in the smaller genera on the other side, the former will be found to include a somewhat larger number of the very common and much diffused or dominant species. This might have been anticipated, for the mere fact of many species of the same genus inhabiting any country shows that there is something in the organic or inorganic conditions of that country favourable to the genus, and consequently we might have expected to have found in the larger genera, or those including many species, a larger proportional number of dominant species. But so many causes tend to obscure this result, that I am surprised that my tables show even a small majority on the side of the larger genera. I will here allude to only two causes of obscurity. Fresh water and salt-loving plants generally have very wide ranges, and are much diffused, but this seems to be connected with the nature of the stations inhabited by them, and has little or no relation to the size of the genera to which the species belong. Again, plants low in the scale of organization are generally much more widely diffused than plants higher in the scale, and here again there is no close relation to the size of the genera. The cause of lowly organized plants ranging widely will be discussed in our chapter on geographical distribution. From looking at species as only strongly marked and well-defined varieties, I was led to anticipate that the species of the larger genera in each country would oftener present varieties than the species of the smaller genera. For wherever many closely related species, i.e. species of the same genus, have been formed, many varieties or incipient species ought, as a general rule, to be now forming. Where many large trees grow, we expect to find saplings. Where many species of a genus have been formed through variation, circumstances have been favourable for variation, and hence we might expect that the circumstances would generally still be favourable to variation. On the other hand, if we look at each species as a special act of creation, there is no apparent reason why more varieties should occur in a group having many species than in one having few. To test the truth of this anticipation, I have arranged the plants of twelve countries, and the coleopterous insects of two districts, into two nearly equal masses, the species of the larger genera on one side, and those of the smaller genera on the other side, and it has invariably proved to be the case that a larger proportion of the species on the side of the larger genera presented varieties than on the side of the smaller genera. Moreover, the species of the larger genera which present any varieties invariably present a larger average number of varieties than do the species of the small genera. Both these results follow when another division is made, and when all the least genera, with from only one to four species, are altogether excluded from the tables. These facts are of plain signification on the view that species are only strongly marked and permanent varieties, for wherever many species of the same genus have been formed, or where, if we may use the expression, the manufactory of species has been active, we ought generally to find the manufactory still in action, more especially as we have every reason to believe the process of manufacturing new species to be a slow one. And this certainly holds true, if varieties be looked at as incipient species, for my tables clearly show, as a general rule, that wherever many species of a genus have been formed, the species of that genus present a number of varieties, that is, of incipient species, 
beyond the average. It is not that all large genera are now varying much, and are thus increasing in the number of their species, or that no small genera are now varying and increasing. For if this had been so, it would have been fatal to my theory, inasmuch as geology plainly tells us that small genera have in the lapse of time often increased greatly in size, and that large genera have often come to their maxima, declined, and disappeared. All that we want to show is, that where many species of a genus have been formed, on an average many are still forming, and this certainly holds good. Many of the species included within the larger genera resemble varieties in being very closely, but unequally, related to each other, and in having restricted ranges. There are other relations between the species of large genera and their recorded varieties, which deserve notice. We have seen that there is no infallible criterion by which to distinguish species and well-marked varieties, and when intermediate links have not been found between doubtful forms, naturalists are compelled to come to a determination by the amount of difference between them, judging by analogy whether or not the amount suffices to raise one or both to the rank of species. Hence the amount of difference is one very important criterion in settling whether two forms should be ranked as species or varieties. Now, Fries has remarked in regard to plants, and Westwood in regard to insects, that in large genera the amount of difference between the species is often exceedingly small. I have endeavoured to test this numerically by averages, and, as far as my imperfect results go, they confirm the view. I have also consulted some sagacious and experienced observers, and, after deliberation, they concur in this view. In this respect, therefore, the species of the larger genera resemble varieties, more than do the species of the smaller genera. Or, the case may be put in another way, and it may be said, that in the larger genera, in which a number of varieties or incipient species greater than the average are now manufacturing, many of the species already manufactured still, to a certain extent, resemble varieties, for they differ from each other by a less than the usual amount of difference. Moreover, the species of the larger genera are related to each other in the same manner as the varieties of any one species are related to each other. No naturalist pretends that all the species of a genus are equally distinct from each other. They may generally be divided into subgenera, or sections, or lesser groups. As Fries has well remarked, little groups of species are generally clustered like satellites around other species. And what are varieties but groups of forms? unequally related to each other, and clustered round certain forms, that is, round their parent species. Undoubtedly there is one most important point of difference between varieties and species, namely, that the amount of difference between varieties, when compared with each other, or with their parent species, is much less than that between the species of the same genus. But when we come to discuss the principle, as I call it, of divergence of character, we shall see how this may be explained, and how the lesser differences between varieties tend to increase into the greater differences between species. There is one other point which is worth notice. Varieties generally have much restricted ranges. This statement is indeed scarcely more than a truism. For, if a variety were found to have a wider range than that of its supposed parent species, their denominations would be reversed. But there is reason to believe that the species which are very closely allied to other species, and in so far resemble varieties, 
often have much restricted ranges. For instance, Mr. H. C. Watson has marked for me in the well-sifted London catalogue of plants, fourth edition, sixty-three plants which are therein ranked as species, but which he considers as so closely allied to other species as to be of doubtful value. These sixty-three reputed species range on an average over six-point-nine of the provinces into which Mr. Watson has divided Great Britain. Now, in this same catalogue, fifty-three acknowledged varieties are recorded, and these range over seven-point-seven .7 provinces, whereas the species to which these varieties belong range over fourteen-point-three provinces so that the acknowledged varieties have very nearly the same restricted average range, as have the closely allied forms, marked for me by Mr. Watson as doubtful species, but which are almost universally ranked by British botanists as good and true species. Summary Finally, varieties cannot be distinguished from species, except, first, by the discovery of intermediate linking forms, and, secondly, by a certain indefinite amount of difference between them. For two forms, if differing very little, are generally ranked as varieties, notwithstanding that they cannot be closely connected, but the amount of difference considered necessary to give to any two forms the rank of species cannot be defined. In genera having more than the average number of species in any country, the species of these genera have more than the average number of varieties. In large genera the species are apt to be closely but unequally allied together, forming little clusters round other species. Species very closely allied to other species apparently have restricted ranges. In all these respects, the species of large genera present a strong analogy with varieties. And we can clearly understand these analogies if species once existed as varieties and thus originated, whereas these analogies are utterly inexplicable if species are independent creations. We have also seen that it is the most flourishing or dominant species of the larger genera within each class, which on an average yield the greatest number of varieties, and varieties, as we shall hereafter see, tend to become converted into new and distinct species. Thus the larger genera tend to become larger, and throughout nature the forms of life which are now dominant tend to become still more dominant, by leaving many modified and dominant descendants. But, by steps hereafter to be explained, the larger genera also tend to break up into smaller genera. And thus, the forms of life throughout the universe become divided into groups subordinate to groups. End of chapter 2 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 9th, 2006, in Oceanside, California.